So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this month's Digging In with TPS MTSU. We are really excited to be back with you this month um, as we explore our topic uh, for our most recent newsletter, which is World Religions. But before we get into that, just a few quick reminders. Um, so first off, again, we always like for these sessions to be interactive. So, you know, the same things we say every month, uh, you know, feel free to, to use the chat box. Uh, we do want to keep our mics muted for clean audio, uh, and then, of course, to have our, our names um, so we can see who we're talking with. Um, if you've not had a chance to join us ever for one of our live sessions, we invite you to do so. Again, we do try to make these as fun and interactive as possible um, for those who join us live. So with this entire series, we do have a Padlet uh, where you can go and find um, all of the resources uh, referenced in the, uh, the individual sessions. Um, in one place. Um, and I realized today that this is actually, I believe, the 24th um, webinar that we have done in this series. So we've, again, quite a nice collection of resources and materials that are there and available on that Padlet. So with that said, I'm going to turn things over to my colleague, Stacey, uh, who's going to introduce our topic for the month. Thank you, Kira. I'm going to share my screen so that you can take a look at the newsletter. If you haven't already opened this up, uh, I came out almost a couple weeks ago. And we decided to do another world history or, or try to do some world history uh, curriculum, um, as well as uh, some more religious history. And so we, we picked world religions, but that also includes the United States as part of the world. Uh, so some of these uh, resources are gonna be a bit more domestic than foreign um, because the Library of Congress uh, does have a lot of resources that you can use for those world history themed courses. But of course they're, they're fewer and farther between, and they're harder to find, and there aren't as many of them uh, as for all of the American history uh, resources on there for obvious reasons. But we still, uh, we hear you when, you when you tell us that you have these needs and we try. Uh, so this was our, an, another attempt uh, to try to find resources uh, for teachers doing world history topics. And so, uh, World religions, uh, we've uh, linked here in the blurb, which is of course this little theme description here, uh, some of the other newsletters that we've done on world history topics. And then of course, we've also done an issue on American religion specifically. Uh, so those are all related to this month's issue. If you wanna review those uh, to find and to kind of pair the resources together. Um, our awesome source of the month is from one of my favorite photograph collections on the Library of Congress website by a man named Sergei Prokudin Gorsky, who took pictures all across the Russian empire um, around the year 1900. And he took them with this very, at the time, innovative uh, photographic process where he layered colored plates on top of each other. Uh, and put them on top of what would have been an originally black and white photograph. So they have this wonderful, beautiful, crisp look to them. So they look like they were taken in like the 1960s or 70s, but they were actually taken between 1905 and 1915, uh, which is really incredible. And of course, the Russian Empire, which stretched across Northern Asia, um, had a lot of different religious and ethnic uh, minorities and majorities represented within it. Uh, and so one is, example from that is um, there are a lot of photographs of Jewish groups living uh, in Russian, in Russia or Russian occupied areas at the time. And so this is uh, one example of those photographs, a group of Jewish children uh, with a teacher in Samarkand uh, which of course is a very famous city back from the Silk Road days, uh, which is in current day Uzbekistan, so it's Central Asia, uh, but it used to be under the sway of the Russian Empire at the beginning of the 20th century. So that's why that's awesome. Uh, also our news items, uh, we have another webinar series, if you aren't already aware of it, our Discover Tenancy History. 
uh, that's every month as well. So uh, please check uh, that. And uh, we're always reminding people about our YouTube channel. And you might be watching this from the YouTube channel right now. Uh, we Even while we resume in-person events, we are still creating content for our YouTube channel. So there will be new things appearing there uh, every month continuing forward. So uh, our lesson ideas, uh, we're here is going to do uh, a closer look at this one on the Reconquista very soon. And then I'm going to take a closer look on this one about the Church of England. And then we have a couple um, world religions in an American context uh, pieces, one on the Mormons. And um, that, of course, is a religion that has spread across the world, but it was born in America, unlike any other religion that's in America right now. And so um, there's, we're going to be uh, creating more resources on the Mormons coming up. But then we have for our featured feature, some of you might remember a couple, um, a year ago, we did a newsletter on the, you know, American religion or how religion shaped America. And we, it, our digging in was a two hour one. It was a special expanded digging in because we brought in uh, Dr. Andrew Pope of the history department here at MTSU, who's a scholar on American religion. And he uh, gave a really great presentation. So if you're interested in early American religious history, you should check that one out. And there's a lot of uh, resources on the Padlet for that as well. And uh, then we're gonna cover the rest of these things when we get to the resources section at the end of the webinar. I am gonna go ahead and turn it over to Kira to talk about the Reconquista. All right, thank you, Stacy. So let's see, let me pull up. Hold on. I have a special surprise at the end, so I don't want to. I don't want to spoil the surprise. Hold on. All right. So, uh, using place to teach the Reconquista, uh, and specifically in this lesson idea, I was looking at uh, La Mesquita in uh, Cordoba. Uh, Cordoba uh, is in Spain, it's kind of in the southern uh, half of Spain. So uh, one reason that we decided to, to take this approach um, is over the next year, we're going to be thinking about how we can use place um, as, uh, as a primary source, but then also using place in connection with other types of primary sources uh, to teach history and to help our students to better connect with what it is that we are teaching. Uh, and so this is going to be kind of our first uh, kind of foray into that specifically, or that we're really kind of emphasizing that as a specific focus. So to begin with, uh, you know, this may be a topic that you need to provide a little bit of context um, for your students. Um, and in the lesson idea, I actually link to two different uh, resources that you can use for your own background knowledge uh, or that you could share with students. Um, one of them is uh, this book that's available through the Library of Congress that I've showed a, uh, pulled out a page from here. This called Spain, a Country Study. Uh, and of course, this is published in the 20th century, but it's got a nice little history overview section. Um, and I particularly like these maps um, that it shows. So again, kind of give you a good brief overview of the period that we're looking at, uh, which begins around the year 711 uh, and wraps up uh, you know, in the mid 1400s. Um, so that 700 year period between when the, uh, the Muslims come in and took over the Iberian Peninsula and then um, you know, the years of dominance there and then the years that it took for the Christian uh, kingdoms to then push them back out of the Iberian Peninsula uh, and then kind of reunite as one united uh, Spanish country. So what we're going to uh, look at, of course, is that the other uh, resource that I want to mention real quickly, we're not going to look at it. Um, there is a short like four or five minute video that I found on YouTube that again, if you're looking for something that you could show students, this is a good kind of quick explainer. Um, so again, if that's something that you want to use, I definitely, um, you know, I love those little things just to kind of give you a good overview. So for our, our purposes today, though, um, again, uh, you know, we look, look at these four maps here and we can see um, kind of, you know, some different phases of uh, the, re, the Reconquista. So again, as I mentioned earlier, um, this really starts around the year 711, which is the first time that uh, the Moors kind of come up from Northern Africa, um, come into the Iberian Peninsula and begin to, um, 
they kind of actually uh, initially at the invitation from the Visigoths there, uh, and then you know begin to take over uh, and push the the people that were there before um, all the way up to the very northern uh, edges of the peninsula, and then really kind of set up dominance for about uh, 250 years. Um, and during that period of time, um, Cordoba actually becomes kind of uh, it's, it's really the capital of this new independent caliphate. Um, that is a very powerful influence within the Muslim world. Um, and it is there, of course, that they build, uh, you know, lots of mosques, lots of buildings. There's a lot of architectural remnants that we can see from their time there. Um, and then, uh, you know, after about 250, 300 years, uh, unfortunately that, uh, you know, they didn't have strong leaders. And then that region uh, begins to break up into individual city states. And as that happens, um, that really kind of opens the door for uh, the Christians in the north to begin to kind of come down and attack and begin to try to push them um, out of the out of the Iberian Peninsula. And so you can see from these four maps kind of some different stages um, of the Reconquista, um, kind of how that happened. Uh, and so by you know 1248, really the Muslims are left with kind of a small area here around Granada. Um, which they were able to keep largely because they had made a deal uh, with the Christian uh, monarchs there um, that they paid uh, you know, taxes and they were sort of left alone. So they had this kind of deal worked out for, for a while. Uh, and then uh, eventually they, the Christian kings decided they, they didn't like that deal anymore and they pushed them completely off the peninsula. So with that kind of understanding of kind of the, the overall kind of a time span of what we're looking at here, we want to look specifically at Cordoba, uh, and in particular at the uh, the mosque that was built there, that is now currently a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, and so there's a good short little video that's available through uh, UNESCO to kind of introduce you to this. And so we are going to watch this, and actually I may need to stop sharing for just a second to make sure that we can get audio. So hold on. multicultural city, the historic center of Cordoba. Cordoba lies in Andalusia in southern Spain. It is a city rich in history and dates back to Roman times. There's a Roman bridge over the Guadalquivir River. For 2,000 years, people from diverse ethnic and religious backgrounds have set foot on it. After the end of the Roman Empire, Cordoba was ruled by the Christians in the 6th century AD. By the 8th century, Islamic power from North Africa began to gain force. Eventually, the city became its capital. It was during Islamic rule that Cordoba reached the height of its beauty and was hailed as the jewel of the West. Labyrinth-like alleys here in the old part of the city reveal typical Islamic features. These patios are unique to Islamic architecture. They're decorated with flowers and plants. Water fountains and wells are another typical feature of a patio. Water and greenery were always sought after by Muslims who lived in the arid stretches of the desert. Mesquita, the largest Islamic mosque in Europe. A chamber dedicated to worship with its forest of pillars. Massive double arches support the 850 columns. The shape of the arches are said to have been created based on Roman building techniques. The pillars were built in a variety of architectural styles. Deep inside the mesquita lies the mihrab. Muslims prayed here in the direction of Mecca. The octagonal shaped interior walls are decorated with exquisite relief of flowering grass motifs. Beyond the forest of pillars, a totally different view comes into sight, a Christian cathedral. In the 13th century, Cordoba was once again under Christian rule. There was a proposal to transform Mesquita into a Catholic cathedral but the people of Cordoba chose to preserve the beauty of Mesquita. A 
mosque and a cathedral came to coexist. It is one of the world's leading examples of religious tolerance. Cordoba, a city offering an exotic fusion of cultures and religions to the world. So that video can be used to kind of, again, provide a the bit... Multicultural city, oh, the history... Um, provide a bit of a kind of introduction and give you a sense of the building uh, and the scale of it. Um, I especially like because you get kind of that overhead bird's eye view so you can see how big it is and you can also see how the the Christian portion of the um, the the cathedral piece of it comes up out of the center which really uh, of course was added later. Um, I will say that the piece there at the end where they're talking about religious tolerance is definitely an overstatement um, of, of the actual history of the, the area. <laughs> um, so, but for this activity, what we want students to do is um, to analyze some different images that are available through the Library of Congress um, from, these are from the late 19th century. Um, they're very stylized and I, I love the collection of pictures. Um, so, but to look at them and try to identify where do we see architectural features that re remind us of uh, kind of Muslim architecture versus uh, architectural features that remind us of more um, Christian uh, influences. So that we can see how this building has kind of blended the two together, which again is very unique because most of the time what happened once the Christians took back over is they actually destroyed the mosques that were there and rebuilt cathedrals in their places. Um, so the fact that this one was not torn down, but was instead uh, kind of renovated um, to be able to have Christian services in it makes it very um, unique. So here are two. There are about four that I have pulled, pulled out as examples um, here. You'll see in the link that I provided in the lesson idea, there's about six or seven that you could pick from. Most of these are interior shots. There are a couple that are exterior. Um, so. A couple of things that you, know, you would want to point out first off, you can see in this one, of course, again, we see those arches um, that we saw in the video. Um, we see the columns that are referenced. Um, you know, the interesting about the columns uh, is that actually most of those were probably pilfered from uh, Roman and uh, buildings that were there in the region prior to the building um, of El, Mos El Mosquito. So, um, you know, those are, they're repurposing architectural features from other buildings in the region. So we see here then in this image, uh, some of this relief up here, which we can't see in great detail, but this is definitely much more of a, a Christian influence um, with these. But the detail that we see both here, uh, that we can see on these arches, um, and that we can see over here, these are definitely much more uh, kind of the scrolly uh, imagery, kind of flower imagery that are more uh, common among uh, Muslim architecture. So again, things that you would want your students uh, to point, uh, to pick out. So two others. Um, so this one definitely is uh, the, the Christian portion of the building that was added later on. And so again, it's gonna look much more reminiscent of what we would think of as a typical um, cathedral that we would see in other places in Europe. Um, so we see um, the choir area here. Again, the statuary that's gonna be back here. That's gonna be again, very unique. You don't have statuary in a mosque. Um, and then in the exterior shot that we see here, of course, we have the bell tower. Um, and so this is, of course, later on, once it was converted back to uh, Christian use is when they went back and added the bells. Before that, uh, there was, uh, you know, Muslim uh, mosques have, um, I forget what they're called, but they do have a, a piece that comes up. Minarets. Minarets, yes. Um, so, uh, you know, they have those, so it's, you know, this would have been refashioned uh, to be a bell tower later on. So again, you can see how each of these, uh, if you didn't know that they were all the same building, it's really kind of amazing that each of these four imagery, it is all of the same building. Um, but you can see very different architectural styles that we see within this building reflecting the different uses that it had uh, for all the different uh, religious ceremonies and religious traditions um, of those groups. And of course you have this shot, which is really what this building uh, is most known for is again, this forest of pillars and, and arches that it has. Um, and so again, just huge wide open spaces that people would have gathered uh, to pray when it was being used as a mosque. 
The other thing that you can do here with your students, again, to kind of help them uh, try to think about what it is that they're looking at in these images. Um, so I pulled here, this is an image from uh, a Quran uh, from around the same time period um, that, the, that the original mosque was being constructed. And so you would want them to notice the design work um, that was included here in the Quran. And then uh, to think about how that is reflected, again, in the imagery that we see here, uh, especially here are these arches and kind of again that, that flowery motif interlocking imagery that we see. Um, and that will help them again uh, if they're not you know, really familiar with what uh, you know the interior of Muslim architecture looks like, um, you know, get to make those connections. Uh, so that is another way that you can draw that out for students. Uh, and again, this is just a really interesting way to think about again how one building um, can really represent, you know, over 700 years of history uh, and how two uh, you know, different religions um, you know, use the building, shape the building for its uses, uh, and it can be reflected uh, in that building that is still standing today that you can go visit. Um, and as a point of comparison, because it's not the only building uh, that it kind of follows a, a similar trajectory, um, you could use this as a point of comparison for another famous religious building uh, in Istanbul, which uh, the, and I'm probably going to mispronounce it, the Hagia Sophia? Hagia Sophia, yes. Yeah, uh, which of course was the uh, primary church of Constantinople, uh, Byzantine, uh, the, the gem of Byzantine architecture. Um, and then, uh, you know, later on, once uh, is, you know, Constantinople was taken over and becomes Istanbul, is converted into being a mosque. Um, so kind of the opposite trajectory that uh, La Mesquita has. Uh, and so, again, you know, very interesting to see that these two buildings, which, again, were both, you know, the original buildings that were built were definitely, uh, you know, highlights um, for the period, highlights for the religious traditions that they were built for. Um, and both were saved from destruction, but converted um, after the regions were taken over by a different religious group. Um, so again, interesting points of comparison for how you can look at these buildings and these places to teach um, that change over time. So hopefully this kind of gives you some ideas about how you know you could pull out and use uh, again buildings like this architectural features uh, to help illustrate um, that that story and that history. Um, and what I wanted to share with you guys as uh, an aside um, is I actually had the chance. One reason I went to do uh, La Mesquita was that I was there this summer, um, and this is actually one of my favorite pictures from the interior again because you see that gorgeous blending of the um, uh, the Islamic and the Muslim architectural features with the the Christian iconography. Um, and so again, you see these gorgeous um, scroll work and the arches that are done here. And then of course, then we have uh, the crucifixion here. Um, so again, it's just, it's an amazing building. One of the, the coolest buildings that I've ever personally seen. And so I think that it's just a really cool place again that we can think about how we teach, um, you know, this period for our students. So with that, I'm going to turn things back over to Stacy. That is so beautiful, and uh, I'm jealous. I've never been there, but uh, one day I, I want to go and see that building for myself. And I love how you uh, compare it to a manuscript page uh, so they can see the importance of this type of illustration uh, permeating Islamic culture, not just their religious buildings, but their texts and, and, and just kind of the, so that way students can recognize Islamic art in whatever medium that they see it in. So um, I am going to take us back to the newsletter. There we go. And um, we have a new graduate research assistant, uh, Abby, who's working with us uh, this year. And she has classes on Thursday afternoon, so she's not ever able to join in on our digging in webinars. But I told her that I would present the lesson idea that she did for this month uh, on the Church of England because she loves world history and she's she loves Henry VIII, 
Uh, so she wanted to um, pull from what the library has on Henry VIII and as well as a couple other resources from an outside website and talk more about the Church of England and how, yes, this is an example of Christianity in the theme of world religions, but it's a, that very important split uh, during the Protestant Reformation where um, different principalities uh, separate from the church at Rome in the 16th century and how it's not just a religious matter, it's political and it becomes social and cultural too with time. Because of course the Church of England is still to this day uh, a separate church that's headed by the, um, the monarch. So now the head of the Church of England is King Charles III. So I'm, just, I'm still getting used to saying that. <laughs> Go Charles. Okay. So uh, this is the context of the Protestant Reformation, of course. Uh, so uh, she talks about that some. And England, like a lot of the other Northern European countries, uh, tending to favor uh, the Protestantism uh, of these this new kind of movement, as opposed to uh, you know starting to question the um, the wisdom of uh, continued uh, political and religious alliance with the Church at Rome, uh, which they feel is very distant, um, and so. She has a lot of resources that are linked in through here. So for example, the very first link is to this blog post from the law, law library at the Library of Congress, uh, talking about is extinguishing the Pope's power in England and what the legal steps were that Henry VIII took to legally separate uh, himself from that. And it wasn't just that he declared, I'm going to establish the Church of England and be completely independent of it. And I'm head of this new church and where, you know, I don't have to do anything that the Pope says anymore. It wasn't a one step deal. It happened in a series of steps over a few years in the 1530s. And so this blog post a very nicely and uh, in an easy to read way takes you through some of those steps. So maybe for this might be um, a bit heavy for seventh graders, but this is certainly a really good resource for teachers to read, uh, to brush up on this uh, and bring in that kind of contextual information to help introduce this topic in the classroom. So um, some of the reasons, of course, why Henry VIII wanted to break from the church at Rome was not just because he swept up in this kind of religious reform like Martin Luther was in Germany, but also famously because he wanted to divorce his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. And she's the mother of Queen Mary, who is Henry VIII's first child. And Catherine of Aragon is from Spain and she and her daughter Mary are very Catholic. So this divorce is not just, you know, something that the Pope is gonna have a problem with, but something that's also gonna create a lot of political tensions with a Catholic country, a powerful Catholic country. So this is one way in which the politics and the religion really overlap in the in the the whole saga and uh so but at first it's not just that he decides to break with rome he actually is trying to think of ways to limit rome's power in england without that formal break yet so it's kind of what are the increments taking place. And so there's a Reformation Parliament uh, with the rise of Thomas Cromwell because Cardinal Wolsey couldn't get him the divorce that he wanted. So he kicks him out and brings in somebody new. And they try to think through the steps that he'll have to 
take in order to get this dispensation. And there are a lot of religious reasons behind this too. They're very similar to, you know, things going on in other countries during the Protestant Reformation um, with the way that the Catholic Church collects fees and raises money. And of course, money is a really a, another huge issue uh, when it comes to controlling the religion in your country. Because if Henry VIII has control of, of the church, then he also can control the wealth and the money and the direction in which that money flows. And that's a really big part of it because the Catholic Church was extraordinarily wealthy by the beginning of the 16th century and powerful uh, in Europe. So that, you know, how do we how do we break that and how do we get some of that for for our own country? So um, he does have these different acts that the Reformation Parliament passes, and this, you know, the blog entry goes through these different ones. And so he does marry Anne Boleyn in 1533, and that's when Elizabeth I was born. So Queen Elizabeth I, uh, who will become queen after her big sister Mary. Um, and so right after that, the year after that, uh, you have these different acts that are passed. And one of them is the act of succession in which Henry skips Mary and says, you know, Elizabeth is going to be my next in line until I have a son, which he does with a later wife, but that's not part of this particular lesson. And, um, so Mary is cut out largely because she's Catholic. Um, and then the Treason Act comes out uh, and it's only in 1536 that the final break with the Pope uh, who is the Bishop of Rome happens. And so again, just, you know, your students might think this all happens at once because when you're talking about history and complicated subjects in history, you know, popular perception is that, oh, these things all happen in like, you know, one big thing happens and then we move on to the next big thing that happens. Whereas the big things are actually, you know, done in small little pieces sometimes. And so that's the case here. So we are going to switch back to the lesson idea and look at some of the other things that are included in here. So she gives you links for um, background information because this is assuming that students will do this after they've already talked a bit about the Protestant Reformation. And so what this links to uh, among other things is, excuse me, uh, one of our brand new primary source sets that Abby also created for us on the Protestant Reformation. And so this has a whole page about the spread of information and the impact of the printing press on how these new ideas are able to spread so quickly and so thoroughly uh, through Europe at this time. So that's gonna be a very important piece of context. And then the Protestant Reformation, uh, with some good links on here. Uh, some links are to the Library of Congress resources, but if some of them are also to uh, resources outside the Library of Congress, and those are indicated uh, in parentheses. And then you can see here, we have a whole page on the Tudor dynasty, which is a Henry VIII's family and their separation from the church. Uh, so there's even more on this, uh, as well as talk more about his first two wives, Catherine of Aragon, the one that he divorced, and uh, Anne Boleyn, the mother of Elizabeth II, who actually ends up having a worse fate than Catherine of Aragon because she ends up being beheaded. Um, anyway, so, oh, I'm sorry. I'm gonna go back to, here we go, the lesson idea. So that is, then you talk students through why he wanted to break with the church. What are all the different uh, things going on in his mind 
So you can talk about, you know, wanting to marry Anne Boleyn so he can have a male heir, which was a very, very important um, wanting power, of course, as the supreme head of the church, which also leads to control over the money. And one of the things that happens with uh, the, the establishment of the Church of England is that all the different monastic institutions that have been founded in England for the last 1,000 years uh, are dissolved because they are now property of the state. They are now property of the English government. And many of them were very wealthy. And so Henry saw them as very right pickings in order to replenish the coffers of the state government's you know, finances, as well as to have very plum gifts uh, to give to his supporters. Uh, so he ends up, a lot of these uh, monasteries that are dissolved end up becoming properties of wealthy families that were supporting him at the time. And so if you visit England, you'll notice that when you visit old monasteries, a lot of them are going to have their histories end uh, in the 16th century because of this dissolution right here. Uh, and then of course there is, you know, the religious, there is some sincerity to the religious aspects of having a religion that's more kind of pertinent to England and English tradition instead of, you know, always being under the direction of a Pope at Rome who's usually an Italian. I don't think there's ever been an English Pope, but don't quote me on that. Okay, so the two texts that this, uh, the two primary source texts that this lesson plan looks at are the Act of Supremacy, which is the one that establishes Henry as the head of the church, and then the Treason Act of 1530, and they're both from 1534. So um, the Act of Supremacy is just one paragraph, and we're going to come back to this in a minute. The Treason Act is longer, but that's why Abby has suggested maybe just zooming in on the first and third paragraphs as um, kind of more manageable text excerpts to hand out to your students. And uh, suggest doing a primary source analysis, uh, looking at the text. So we're gonna look at the act of supremacy right now uh, to kind of work through some of this language here because it can be difficult. Uh, and I'm going to share my, hang on a sec. I'm gonna need to share to my PowerPoint. How do I do this? Okay, all right, so here we are. And you can see this is the whole text of the act. And it's also one sentence. Uh, and of course, this is 16th century, but it's modernized English. This is not the original uh, English uh, because some of the spelling has been you know, changed and, and that kind of thing. Um, but it's still quite a mouthful, especially if you're trying to um, read this with seventh graders. So basically, uh, one thing that you can do is kind of break it down. And there's a lot of formulaic language. There's a lot of fluff language. And then it's like, OK, where are the sentences that actually say something? So I. I'm going to zoom in on what I think are the core parts of this act of secession. So first of all, you have to wait till you get down here till you get to some kind of subject verb, right? So by the authority of this present parliament that the king, our sovereign lord, his heirs and successors, kings of this realm, shall be taken, accepted, and reputed the only supreme head in earth of the Church of England. So that's the basic essence of this act is to make the king the supreme head of the Church of England. But of course, it doesn't just say that. It has to say it in all of this language as well. So next, we have this. So in addition to that, 
the king is still the subject here, shall have and enjoy, so annexed and united to the imperial crown, the title and style thereof. So in other words, what are the goodies that come with being supreme head? So the goodies are the honors, dignitaries, preeminences, jurisdictions, privileges, authorities, immunities, profits, very big, and commodities to the second dignity of the supreme head of the same church belonging and appertaining. So what belongs to, what appertains to the church uh, is now belongs to the crown. It belongs to the realm and uh, it belongs to the supreme head. So that's the next part. And then um, the last part that I felt was actually saying something is, okay, also this act establishes that our said sovereign Lord, his heirs and successors, kings of this realm, you can already see right there, they're repeating it. So it's formulaic language, shall have full power and authority from time to time to visit, repress, redress, record, order, correct, restrain, and amend all such errors, heresies, abuses, offenses, contempts, and enormities, whatsoever they be, which by any matter of spiritual authority or jurisdiction ought or may lawfully be reformed, repressed, ordered, addressed, corrected, restrained, or amended. So in other words, as supreme head of the church, the king has the power to suppress heresy. So if you break away from the Church of England, you can be declared a heretic and the king can punish you because he has that power. So these three things I, uh, I felt like made up the core of the act. And then I broke it down even further by, and this is something that maybe if you have the time to work through this text with your students, you can do with them, you know, underline what the core core parts are. So by the authority of this present parliament, the king shall be taken the only supreme head and in earth of the Church of England and shall have all honors and all these other goodies and that our sovereign Lord shall have full power to visit, repress, redress, etc. All such errors and heresies. So that gives him control over religious doctrine. It gives him control over religious property and pretty much control over everything that the Pope uh, would have control over. So these are, these are gonna be very important because uh, this is not just, you know, a religious power here, but this is melding it forevermore to the power of the state. So it's a complete and utter meld of religious and political power in England. And this is one of the things that the framers of the constitution in the United States wanted to be sure to avoid uh, and that's why we have the Establishment Clause uh, in the First Amendment of the Constitution, so that we have a separation of church and state. Okay, so um, that's kind of what I wanted to share in terms of going through uh, that particular lesson idea. Now, there is one last link that uh, she includes. Okay, and, and that is another blog from the Law Library talking about when Henry VIII finally does have a male heir who will become Edward VI, but he dies as a teenager. So he's, he doesn't have any heirs and then you get Lady Jane Grey and, and then Elizabeth and all that kind of stuff. So um, it talks uh, about Henry VIII's marriages and his wives and his children and the constantly changing succession. And so if you want to go over that with students as an extension uh, to the lesson idea, you can talk about this in the context of Henry VIII just marrying a lot of people. And uh, that's always fun because that's of course what your students will remember about Henry VIII, not necessarily that he became the head, the supreme head of the church and established the Church of England independent from the Church of Rome, which is more consequential in the long run, 
they'll remember that he had six wives. So uh, you can add more kind of substance to that with that particular blog post and talk about his heirs and the importance of a male heir. But then of course, who becomes the more important successor? Well, it's Elizabeth I, of course. She was incredibly important and uh, just goes to show he should have just been satisfied. Anyway, so now I'm going to show you some of the additional resources that we have here in the newsletter. I'm going to start with the important links box on page two because uh, we do have some pre existing things that we have created in the past uh, that deal with. world religions, and uh, one of them being Greek and Roman um, history, because, uh, you know, Greek and Roman mythology and religion is uh, something that students will be learning about in sixth grade. So here we have this uh, kind of one of our older primary source sets on Greece and Rome. Uh, there is a bit about world religions, uh, this film uh, at the National Book Festival of 2015. It's an hour and 45 minutes long, so you might want to pre-watch it in bits and just choose excerpts of it for uh, having your students listen to. There is um, an outside website, uh, Think For It, that talks about ancient Egyptian religion, which is also sixth grade. Now, this one is something that is mentioned in the blurb on page one. It's an issue of a magazine called Middle Level Learning talking about teaching world religions in middle school, uh, particularly the sense, you know, advice on how to approach this sensitively uh, because you might have some, some kind of misunderstandings with students because religion is very personal to them. So how do you make it something that is historical and a little bit removed and something you can talk about in, in a classroom setting? And so this gives you kind of ways to approach that. Um, and then there is another really good resource uh, from the Georgetown University Center for Contemporary Arab Studies on teaching world religions. Um, and this is kind of talking about, uh, again, how do you talk about religion in a school setting without not just hurting anybody's like personal feelings, but uh, making sure you're not, um, conflating any kind of religious and state kind of issues together? And how do you protect yourself uh, when people might wonder if you're bringing this up in a sensitive and correct way? So those are good resources for that. We also have this lesson activity that we created a while back, uh, quite a while back, that's bringing in some of the illuminated manuscripts that the library happens to have in its collection. And there are three examples in here. One is a Christian Bible, one is a Jiddic uh, Torah, and one is an Islamic Quran. And so they're actually included in, um, you have some worksheets that go along with these. There's one for each. But then you can also just print out the PDFs. So here we have um, a page from a Christian Bible. Uh, and this is actually in German. I can see it, all the uns and mits. So this is not in Latin, but it's it's uh, late medieval, uh, and you can tell with the religious iconography. Um, but then, how is it different from this? This, of course, being a page from the Islamic Quran. Uh, the most obvious difference is you have people uh, that are depicted in the Bible, but you never see that in Islamic art. And as you saw from what Kira showed you, uh, they develop this wonderful kind of you know, floral motifs, leaf, you know, uh, natural motifs, uh, geometric shapes into this. Just, and then, of course, their calligraphy uh, emphasizes that, and it's quite beautiful. And and then this is from um, a Jewish Torah from around the same time period. So a lot of the decoration is very similar to the Bible, but of course the language is completely different and some of the symbols are as well. And so kind of has students discussing the differences and similarities among those. 
And then we have um, two different links at the bottom of this box to the research guide to the Library of Congress, which we are always bringing attention to um, because they have, uh, they have a religion and philosophy. This is a guide to the guides. So all of these are different resource or research guides on the topic of religion or philosophy. So for example, if you want uh, more um, older uh, Hebrew books from the Jewish tradition, you could look at uh, that research guide and find more primary sources there. And the other one, Jewish history. So there's even more here. I'm sorry, this, this is listed under both of them. So that's why I picked it out. So that's uh, a way to find even more things if you're interested in teaching those topics. And then um, the library does not have a whole lot on ancient Buddhism. Unfortunately, uh, the Eastern religions are not as well represented, especially the earlier histories of those. Um, so there is a really great exhibition online that has some resources. and so two of these things were plucked out of that exhibition. So where it says from the exhibition, World Treasures of the Library of Congress Beginnings, this um, piece, uh, this example of the Wheel of Life from Tibetan Buddhism, and then uh, this scroll, uh, the Eight Immortals uh, from the Taoist tradition. Those are both from that. And I'll show you what that exhibition looks like. Um, so here, here's what it looks like. You may have seen it because we may have linked to it in other ways before. Um, and so you can see, okay, Jainism, what is that? And you can look at these beautiful um, other examples of artistic uh, traditions from these uh, Eastern religions, uh, sacred cows, medieval Islamic world maps. Um, and then this, again, this fantastic uh, Tibetan Buddhist wheel of life and have students, okay, what is depicted inside the wheel? Why is there a person holding the wheel? What do all these things symbolize? And then they have um, handy contextualized blurbs that go with them. And then uh, there happens to be an entire collection of Quranic fragments at the Library of Congress uh, within its Arabic, Persian, and Ottoman calligraphy collection. So there is actually quite a lot on this. And so if you look under articles and essays, uh, you can see this is where the Quranic fragments are. Uh, so there's, there's quite a lot of um, examples of early Islamic um, book art. And then here's a really interesting old manuscript here. Uh, this is um, written in Greek, but is found in Egypt. And it's a very, very early papyrus fragment. Uh, and so this is talking, this is really looking at that kind of Greek religious tradition in the Egyptian context during this time period, uh, which would have been, I believe, uh, the early Hellenistic kingdom. So the Ptolemaic dynasty um, after Alexander the Great conquered e uh, Egypt. And it goes with another blog article because we find these blog articles at the Library of Congress very useful. So I'm going to stop sharing and hand it back to Kira. Thank you. So as you guys saw, we again have, uh, yeah, we're able to find quite a few things, uh, you know, dealing with world religions and hopefully will help some of you world history teachers out there who are always asking for resources. Um, so again, just a quick reminder, be sure to check out that Padlet page where you can find um, the links to these resources. And of course, we do want your feedback. So um, if you've had a chance to view today, if you're interested um, in receiving PD credit for your time uh, in completing today's webinar, um, please be sure to uh, fill out the form here or use the QR code um, there to get to this form. We send these out about once a week um, and would love to have your feedback there so that we can get you your PD certificate. We will be continuing our webinar series next month. 
um, and we'll be looking at um, artifacts uh, as primary sources. Uh, so that's our topic for next month's webinar, and that will take place on Thursday, November the 10th. So if that is something that you're interested in, um, please let me know, and we'll be happy to add you to the registration list. Um, and as Stacy mentioned, you can find more information about um, our other webinars and events coming up um, on our upcoming workshops page on the website, or of course, always on the first page of the newsletter. Um, so again, thank you so much for your time uh, and joining us today, uh, and we hope to see you next month.